So dopamine detox, I would have thought was not something real. Um, it seemed kind of silly to me actually. Um, and I'll tell you why it seems silly and why it still seems silly, but why it may have some utility. But then Anna, Dr. Anna Lemke told me that it actually can be quite useful to take some time and space away from social media, certainly from any addictive drugs, that's the treatment for addiction and restore those dopamine levels to baseline. Now, the way that dopamine detoxing was initially described in the Bay Area, where it seemed to be a lot of tech types were talking about it, was in terms of, I heard something like, oh, people aren't even looking at other people's faces. You know, they're really kind of living in this like monkish lifestyle, like no food of, that they really enjoy, no anything. That to me seems kind of crazy and kind of extreme. I mean, I can understand not ingesting a lot of highly palatable foods, you know, eating some blander foods. I can understand not, um, certainly not doing any prescription drugs or taking some time off from caffeine. Caffeine increases dopamine receptors, which makes the, caf the dopamine that's available more powerful at evoking the dopamine response. I can understand avoiding certain substances and behaviors, but the idea that you weren't going to look people in the eye because it was going to be too much dopamine. I mean, I guess it depends on who you're looking in the eye and how much their look positively arouses you. But the fact of the matter is that that's not, that's not a very rational way to think about dopamine detox, but staying out of, you know, high intensity, um, highly rewarding activities. I think could be useful in terms of reestablishing that dopamine balance. And everything we know from Anna's work is that dopamine, you know, if you drive those dopaminergic states too long, addictive drugs, et cetera, people can do this with sex, food, drugs, gambling, social media, all sorts of things, um, pornography, you know, what ends up happening is the amount of dopamine that's released over time goes down and down and down and down and pretty much is traversing into the territory of pain. And then people, again, are back to this thing where, you know, they're scrolling internet porn eight, nine ten times or hours a day. And then they're wondering like why this isn't effective for them anymore, whereas it was before. And there's an additional issue with pornography, which is not often discussed, which is that remember guys in particular, the brain is a learning prediction machine. And if I'm not trying to say that all pornography is bad, but there are good data to support the idea that if your brain learns to be aroused by watching other people have sex, it is not necessarily going to carry over to the ability to get aroused when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, right? The, especially young kids who are consuming a lot of pornography, the brain is learning sexual arousal to other people having sex. So you're going to program yourself into being a voyeur. Or, yeah, or just create challenges in, in sexual interactions with, uh, you know, with, with peer, uh, with, a, with a real partner. Right? Mary Harrington has the three laws of porno dynamics. And the second law of porno dynamics is the law of fap entropy. And it says that whatever you start out wanking to will get progressively more intense over time. And I think that this is sort of speaking to that ever, ever sort of escalating amount of um, the wildness that you need to watch in order to get an ever decreasing stimulus that comes back. Yeah. And you know, here I'm, I'm approaching this only through the lens of biology, right? I'm not a, you know, I'm not a psychologist and I'm certainly not, um, political in it in any way, at least not, I have ideas about politics, but I just don't discuss them publicly. But the, but the idea here is that, you know, I'm not saying pornography as a stimulus is bad or good. What I'm saying is it in its availability and it's, extreme forms it's a very potent stimulus and very potent stimuli of any kind extremely palatable food extreme pornography um extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping those set a threshold for dopamine release and anna will tell you that and i'm sure she did that the higher the dopamine peak the bigger the drop afterwards and it's not that you drop to baseline you drop below baseline so Again, it's not, these things aren't good or bad. They just have to be controlled in a way because when people are pursuing dopamine peaks over and over and over and they aren't getting them, typically it's because they've been pursuing that activity far too often. And you're saying perhaps take a break from that and there may be a, a, an ability for yourself, your system to reset. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in theory, all the things that we're talking about with pornography could be superimposed onto food or could be superimposed onto real sex, right? Um, that one also has to be cautious there, right? But the cycling back and forth between dopamine and low dopamine states, dopamine fasting as it were, but maybe just low dopamine states, these are natural rhythms 
that existed in the nervous system. We had to remember what the dopaminergic system is there for. I'll say it again, I wasn't consulted at the design phase, but we know as a, as a generic form of motivation and pursuit, you can imagine the human or the animal that's hungry or thirsty. It needs energy to go pursue the thing. So the idea that you have to eat in order to get energy, that's true, but you need energy in order to get the thing to eat. So our nervous system has energy also, that's dopamine and epinephrine. Yes, we use glucose and glycogen, et cetera, when we're pursuing things, but the idea here is you're pursuing something and then either by smell or by sight, you think you're on the right track. So you go down that track and then, ah, there it is. You know, you get some berries or you get, you know, let's get prehistoric about this, or you get to kill the prey and eat it. And then it gives you energy to continue this pursuit or to reproduce. I mean, there's a reason why humans and other animals seek out reproduction is that every, every species, but certainly humans have two innate desires built into them, whether or not they decide to actualize this or not, is the desire to protect young and make more of its own species. Every successful species does that. Even if people don't have children, in general, people care about children because they of what they represent. Very few people dislike children. I mean, there are a few mutants out there that dislike children, but you always worry about those kinds of people. Yeah. You were talking earlier on about the fact that dopamine can be released when you set yourself a little goal and then achieve it. And one of the ways that you encourage your grad students is to give them a little bit of reward earlier on so that it keeps them motivated. Is this the same mentality that works during an endurance event when you want to say, I'm just got to get myself to the next lamppost. I've just got to get myself to that hill over there. Is that the same dynamic? Yeah, um, we can call it milestoning. You just set some milestone. And the key thing here is that, and this is the beauty of the dopamine system, just like the stress system is generic, the fear system is generic. It's designed for a bunch of different scenarios. The motivation system is also generic. It can be to achieve the next lamppost as a milestone, or it can be five miles as the next milestone. You get to control that. And it, so it's completely arbitrary, right? I mean, in the, one of the most brilliant things that was ever said to me by an extremely skilled psychoanalyst is so simple, and yet I do think it's the most fundamental thing to understanding oneself is that it's all internal, right? If you finish a marathon in first place, no one comes along and drips dopamine in your ear. You self-generate that. It's all internal. It's all about your internal representation. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't good and bad events in life, but... The fact of the matter is that if you set the next milestone as just outside the distance of what you're comfortable with and you make it there, if you allow yourself a moment to register that win, you get energy to, do, to then set the next milestone and achieve it. That energy is dopamine converted into epinephrine, into adrenaline. And this is why you hear these incredible heroic stories. Like, I mean, I think the movie Lone Survivor, the Marcus Luttrell story. In the movie, he's sort of, it's like fast forward to where he, I don't want to give it away, but where he basically is the lone survivor. But in the book, it's crazy. I mean, the guy dragged himself on elbows and knees for miles and miles and miles, right? You know, th that kind of ability where you hear about people walking on stubs to, you know, these incredible feats of human um, endurance, and willingness to persist. I mean, those people were able to do that, not because of glycogen or they drank their goo or whatever the triathletes are always using. It's because of nervous system energy, the ability to continue to manufacture adrenaline and keep going. And the, and the extent to which that can continue is no one will ever know. I do believe that humans have a tremendous capacity to endure and persist, but that few human beings actually know how to tap into that system except under conditions of extreme survival. And you also hear from really good physicians, ones that aren't into woo biology or woo psychology at all, that to some extent, yes, there are people that unfortunately die in their battle against cancer, no matter what, but that the, the desire to continue living is a powerful force in and of itself. There may be spiritual components, there may be, I, that's not the business I'm in, uh, you know, so and how, I don't know the experiment I would do to test it but almost certainly setting of milestones and the ability to generate dopamine and adrenaline is what allows people to persist and live longer. There's no question about that.